everyone. <clears throat> Lost my voice. <laughs> Hold on. <clears throat> wow, that's weird. Okay, anyway, hello everyone. Criminal profiler Pat Brown, and this is Hangout 35. Uh, and we have folks here in the chat room. This is a live show. If you're if you're part of Patreon, and if you're not, and you'd like to be here, click on the link below. Hello everyone. Let's see who is here before I get started with all the weird cases and news. All right, so we have, let's see, Anna's here, Lisa S is here, and uh, Molly's here, and wait a minute, I'm getting confused. Florence is here, Carrie is here. Okay, and then people are coming in. So, um, I'll, I will say hello to you if I see you coming in. All right, Anne says, you look perfect. Okay, well, good, I'm not like super pink today. <laughs> or super, like, look like I'm one of the people I'm talking about, super dead. Um, can you hear me clearly? Does that work too? Oh, can see and hear me. <sighs> okay, that's awesome. All right, so to start out, I'm just gonna have to start out with uh, <laughs> um, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard um, because the the defamation trial is continuing and I did pop in and uh, look at a piece of it. Uh, it was uh, being uh, analyzed by a behavioral, uh, a behavior guy um, and I'm, the link is below, uh, and <laughs> uh, I enjoyed his take on it. I thought he did a good job, uh, and I have my take on it. So here's my very simple take on it. It's just one sentence. If Amber Heard in the future ever has to play the role of a malignant narcissist, she won't even have to act. That's all I have to say. <laughs> oh, my God. It, the clip I put that I'm linking, when you watch this woman, uh, it, she's so repugnant in, in her, her attitude and the things she says and the way she treats people in the courtroom, the way she looks at them or refuses to look at them with her eye rolls and everything else she does as she's eating during their, when they're talking to her, um, pretty much... If, along with the really great analysis this guy does also just just run through the comments it's like nobody likes you amber nobody <laughs> so it's, uh, it's it's quite unbelievable so mm -mm. Uh, yeah she doesn't need to act if she takes on a role of a serious narcissist because oh my god you know i, I mentioned this before and if you haven't seen the show before and you haven't heard my little Thing about Amber Heard. I was in the green room with her many years ago before she met Johnny Depp and uh, it was a it was a torturous one hour with her in the room and I thought to myself oh my god whoever gets stuck with her is in for hell. I was right that was a good profile but it was just sitting in there listening to her and now I'm seeing her at the trial and I'm like it's coming back to me why I was sitting there and I was like oh my god this woman is so absolutely horrible <laughs> absolutely horrible. You know, I, I don't know how well Johnny knew her before he decided to stick a ring on her finger. Mm, okay, uh, I'm going to stop right there with her. <laughs> oh, you know, Kay Rapp, you're talking about this movie. Um, I looked, I went to look up this movie. Um, if you can all watch a gory movie, watch All the Boys Love Mandy Lane with her in it. She plays it too well. I was going to watch it, but it's 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 like it's like a really bad slasher film, which they say is it, it's it not only is it really gory, and I hate and oppose slasher films, but they, they no nobody liked it, and it, it was supposedly so badly acted. So I don't know about her in it, but uh, uh, if you have if you have the tolerance for that, and you just want to see her do something like you say, maybe herself, <laughs> maybe that's the movie to see. So. Um, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't put myself to it, though. But the, it, the trial thing was really interesting and uh, just, you know, sometimes when you watch something you, and you're, you're trying to figure out if the person is being deceptive or if they have a personality disorder, and especially if they're actors and actresses, it's kind of difficult because they're acting some of the time. And if they're good actors and actresses, sometimes that does cover things up. And not in this case. <laughs> I mean, it's so blatant. It's just like, whoa, you know, it's like, man, if you can act, lady, you should do some of it here in the courtroom because nobody likes you and nobody believes you. OK, so anyway, that's all I'm going to say about <laughs> Amber Heard. OK, <clears throat> to answer some cases, um, 
And uh, this one is a really small thing I just want to talk about just because, you know, I'm amazed when people write, you know, I have an issue with the media. Uh, my issue with the media is that my opinion is you should do some, just like the police should do due diligence in doing their investigation. If you're in the media, you shouldn't just be some parrot who steals stuff from another not another media outlet. And you shouldn't just be there to whip something out in five minutes and don't care about any of the facts. Uh, and I see this happen and it drives me nuts because they, they sometimes put out information and sometimes it even seems very good, but then there's something that just pops up and you say, that's missing. I'm gonna see if you can figure out why, what I thought was really weird about this story. The story itself is a heartwarming, has a heartwarming ending. Here it is. Autistic teen found alive in shivering cold Utah parking lot three years after vanishing from California. Apparently his mother was making lunch in 2019 and he vanished while she was making a sandwich. Okay. Now, <clears throat> he was found sleeping in a Utah gas station, uh, a gas station parking lot, three years after disappearing from his family home. So um, this guy, uh, let's see, the sheriff's deputies were out there and they saw him shivering and cold and they, he appeared homeless and reportedly, reportedly, I always like words that are reportedly, which means where did you get your report from, reportedly. He had been living on the streets there for about two weeks. Okay, was he homeless for two weeks or was he homeless for three years? All right. His family had searched for him for years, handing out flyers, scanning social media, and desperately chasing down fruitless leads. They even moved back to the town of his birth, Idaho Falls, hoping he would eventually make it back there. Wait a minute, if he disappeared, oh, what? Wait a minute, he disappears out of California and then they move to another state? Because he would go to the other state rather than back to the home in California? Don't even understand that. All right, so anyway, now so anyway they looked for him they finally got him and they brought him in and everybody's happy okay which is fine that that's good they found the kid after, who was now 20 years old who's not a kid he's an adult but they found him and could tell the parents now here's what i thought was interesting so autistic how do they say so let me read this again autistic teen well, first of all, he's not a teen. I believe he's 20, so that's not a teen. But okay, autistic, let's say he's 19 and nine months, or 11 months and one, three weeks. Okay, autistic teen found alone, okay? Disappeared for three years when he was 17. Now, here's the part I think was interesting. Um, uh, there's a couple different stories. One of them says he was autistic and had some, um, uh, some kind of emotional problems. Then there was another story and it said he was diagnosed as autistic at the age of 12 or 13, somewhere around there. Now, what does that tell you? The second story that says he was diagnosed at 12 or 13 with autism. Because when you hear the story first, autistic teen missing for three years, and now you hear he was diagnosed at 13. What can you tell me that seems like something some of the information doesn't seem to actually match really correctly. Uh, does anybody have a clue what, I, what, what I'm getting at here? Because of the profile, this is something that stood out to me. And it really bugged me. Anybody got it besides me? <laughs> Not getting a lot of answers here. Mm, I've got you stumped. Okay interesting diagnosed too late in life okay what about that diagnosis what does that tell you that's missing out of this story probably okay closer and he was normal until 13 maybe not normal but there's something else uh well it's not that he turned autistic that's when he was diagnosed and many children, teens, and adults are diagnosed with certain things at different times in their lives. But, no, I'm not saying his parents sucked. <laughs> I'm so mean. Man. Okay. 
All right. Here's the thing which I noted. When I first heard this, autistic teen had been missing for three years. He's been homeless for three years. Where has he been for three years? How, is he, how has he not shown up any place? And they've never been able to find him for three years. And I'm thinking autistic. Uh, ooh, getting close. Yeah, getting closer here. Behavior problem started so explained as autism. Possibly, possibly. Let's say, um, well, ah, uh, okay. Anna is, is coming in on it. He was high functional. Why didn't he call home? Yeah, this is, this is where I'm getting at. When I first read it, I'm thinking 100% autistic. Okay. And I'm like, how the heck did he survive for three years? 100% autistic. You know, it's like, you know, I know severe autism. It's, it's difficult. Then he managed to get to 12 or 13 before anybody gave him an autistic diagnosis. Now, usually when I, I have friends who've had autistic children, they usually know two years old, three years old, it's there. They grow, their kids grow up with it. They have to deal with it in elementary school all the way up. They know their kid is autistic. So I believe that what happens is he displayed certain behavioral issues. He gets to 12 or 13. Uh, and he's having more of those issues. They take him in and they diagnose him with some level of what they call autism. Could be Asperger's, you know, milder forms. I know, I know people with Asperger's, they, they have lives, they go to work, they get married. So I, so I went from, oh, this, this autistic kid who couldn't possibly fend for himself for three years, where the heck has he been? Maybe somebody like kidnapped him or something kept him somewhere to maybe he just let, ran away from home. Maybe he's got emotional problems. He's maybe he does have some level of autism, Aspergery thing, whatever. Maybe he isn't even diagnosed properly. He runs away from home, stays away from home for three years and finally has some bad times. Not saying he's capable or extremely capable of maybe making it on his own. Maybe he's, you know, who knows? He might've been on the streets. Um, a lot of kids who leave home too early and a pro in prostitution and things like that. But I just thought it was really fascinating how, you know, you know, he, how, how that was true. Now he was high functional. Why didn't he call home? Well, that's a good question. Perhaps he never wanted to go home. And so they, so they start out this whole thing as if he's like completely unable to do anything for himself and, oh, thank God they found him to maybe he ran away and didn't want to be found. You know, maybe that's, that's it. Just because you're slightly Aspergery, if that's what they're putting on you as a label uh, and you have emotional problems don't mean you can't function, you know? So I thought that was just interesting. I find it in, uh, fascinating in the way they write these articles and it like, it just annoys me because I'm reading good. Oh my God. Huh? And then I'm like, Oh, second article. Oh, he was diagnosed at what? 12 or 13 years old. Hmm. You know, <laughs> that, that's, that sheds a whole different light on things. Now I still don't know the rest of the story yet, but I just, these, these kind of missing pieces of information, are important to recognize because that's what happens in criminal investigations as well. You're missing one piece of information and it screws your whole investigation up. You look this way because you don't have this piece of information. And I think that's really important. Oh, by the way, if you're new to the channel, forgot to say this. If you're new to the channel, please do subscribe, like, and share. Okay. That's that. All right. Now, well, this is not necessarily true. He, he, he was sleeping outside. Um, where was he for three years? That's the real question. And just because uh, you can be, you can be reasonably functioning. There's a lot of people who are homeless who are, who are, some of them have massively high IQs uh, and, and have come into bad times. You know, kids who leave home and don't have a lot of skills, some of them do end up homeless. You know, um, he might have been in a homeless shelter. He might have, he might have been someplace and worked and then lost his job during a coronavirus. We don't know. So it's just a lot of interesting missing information um uh wouldn't he seek shelter some people don't seek shelter some people i don't know maybe there's just no shelter around there that he found maybe he was maybe got off a bus you know we don't we don't know anything that's that's the point but i just th i'm just pointing out that it went from what i looked at when i hear he was autistic and then 
I'm thinking, how could he even be out there for three years and not have, you know, need, had to be cared for in some way to all of a sudden, oh, he's diagnosed at 12 or 13. He, he may have some level of autism or some Asperger's, but I'm going to say he wasn't what the picture I had originally changed radically when I read the second piece of information. So anyway, now um, I'm going to go on to another news story, which I thought was a really creepy, creepy one. Um, and this is, hold on, I got to find it, got to find it. Ready. Okay, I uh, just want to see if the news has changed since this is a the story about the woman. She's a New York mom. Uh, her name is, and I can't pronounce it, I'm sure, Orsolia Gal, something like that. Um, very pretty, blonde. She's what, 50, 50, real good looking beautiful thin attractive woman she has two children uh one was 17 i believe one 13. her husband and the 17 year old were out of town looking at colleges uh she lived in queens i believe um with and the 13 year old was home with her and they have a a, a house with a number of floors now i just i just want to check one thing out before I, I i say something and then i found the news has come out today that's different so i'm gonna i'm gonna roll her in here just to to see whether um they were talking about they had a suspect in this case, and I'll explain what the case is in just a second. Um, just want to, or, okay, or, hold on a second, I got roll in here. Or, so, there we are. Or, so, like, I wonder what her name is really pronounced like. Okay, they're paying tribute. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is, okay, this is a new one. Ah. Really? Okay, let's see what this report says. Here's here we got these things again. Report says. Hold on one second. This has changed since yesterday. What? What in the world? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna wow, this is a this is a useless article. But anyway, let me read you the original article because that made much more sense. Um all right, so let me tell you what happened to her. All right. Hold on a second, I lost it. Okay. Okay. Hold on a second. Hold on one second, where'd it go? Where'd it go? I had it here, I had it here in that, oh, there we go. Okay. All right, so anyway, this, this woman, um, what happened was she was stabbed from 50 to 60 times in, in the basement of her house, uh, like around the neck area and, and brutally killed. She did have defense wounds on her, um, and her 13-year-old son was on a higher level. He was uh, a few floors up when this all supposedly took place below. Um, it said they had an extensive security system. So anyway, here's what happened. She was stabbed 58 times, and it was outfitted with an advanced surveillance system. Now, she was 51 years old. The police believe that she was attacked on the first floor of the home. Oh, she was attacked on the first floor and then taken into the basement. The killer then placed her body in a duffel bag and dragged her remains in a, to a nearby park early Saturday morning. And there's a video of this. If you put in her name, there is actually a video. Um, and you see the guy dragging, it's on wheels, it's a duffel bag with wheels, pulling her from the house down, down to this park, okay, and where he dumped the body. This is a very strange case, which is why I'm bringing it up. Um, now, Get this one. Now here's the here's the important weird clue about this whole thing. The police followed a trail of blood from the bag that led them about a half a mile to her house. Okay, so the guy removed her from the house, put her in the duffel bag, pulled her away, dumped her in a park, but he left a trail of blood all the way from the bag to the house so that they could backtrack like, you know, backtrack like breadcrumbs, you know? That's pretty weird. Okay, um, uh, this is true. Uh, that person looks very small in stature. Yeah, she does appear, at, I was trying to find that out, how, how tall she, she's, she's a thin, very attractive, thin, um, seems like a, a smaller package. In other words, they might not be able to drag me around like if they dragged her around. <laughs> so, um, I, this I don't know, Lisa. So the assailant carried her up some stairs. I don't know. Uh, one thing I don't know is where where the door was. When you have a basement, she might have been attacked on the first floor and, 
and taken to the basement and then taken out a basement door. You know, some of those have those accesses, you know, where you go down a few couple, you know, I don't know. Uh, that information I haven't been able to find um, because this is the media and it's, it sucks. So, you know, you don't get all that great information. Okay, so they followed a trail back. So again, the husband and the 17-year-old son were out of, out, of, out of state. And the youngest son has reportedly been ruled out as a suspect. They did take him on handcuffs to the police station and then returned him to the home. Okay. Police sources say they're investigating multiple suspects and do not, God, who wrote this crap? Do not premeditated given house. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> do not premed, this is actually independent. Can they, can, can people write anymore? And do they, do they do any kind of, oh my God. <sighs> do not premeditated <laughs> is not premeditated they're saying given how sloppy the crime scene was there was also no sign of forced entry all right now they're looking at a couple of people one is a handyman oh this is the funny part of the story i don't know if there's anything funny about it but people, they say the, the husband and the wife have this great marriage but they're looking at her ex-lover. <laughs> I, I think that was the handyman. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to say their, their marriage was a wee bit shaky if she's having a, an affair with the handyman. Anyway, um, so, but they, they, at this point, don't know what happened to her. Let's see. Um, They supposedly have reported, oh, here's what they said. Detectives believe her attacker was known to have given the, was known to her given the severity of the wounds and have reportedly identified a person of interest. Reportedly, reportedly, reportedly. I wish they'd stop saying that crap. In other words, if you, oh, it drives me crazy. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. This gets, this is where the thing gets weird. Um, oh, <laughs> oh, well, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Wait a minute. Hold on. Lisa said, that person looks very small in stature and that we're talking about that the, the, she was being dragged along in the duffel bag. And I thought, Lisa, I thought you mean, meant uh, the, 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 the victim who was fairly small in stature, but you point out something interesting. I meant the one pulling, dragging the duffel bag. I also saw that. I also thought the person looked kind of small in stature. I agree. But it's hard to tell unless you do some real work with the video, you know, measuring things against trees and fences and whatever you're measuring it against to determine the actual size of the person. It gets really tricky uh, and, and I don't have skill in that. So um, then, okay, so now Molly says, interesting, she was taken out of the home and then left in a public spot. <sighs> this is what I find very interesting. So this is not a premeditated homicide and I, I tend to agree with that. Um, seems like somebody really got pissed off for whatever reasons somebody who had access to the home they did say that uh, i guess the handyman had a key or something could get in the home um and of course there is the 13 year old son who also is in the home uh, and maybe there's another person who has access to the home um where something happened to, to enrage this person and they did this here's what's so weird why take the body out of the home what is the purpose of that? Now, you know, if you've stabbed somebody 60 times, there's blood all over the home. The person's knowingly dead. You drag the, put a person in a duffel bag and, and, and haul them down a sidewalk and then just leave them in, in, a, in a place where they're, they're going to be found. Um, What's the purpose of moving the body from the house? Anybody want to go on on that? Um, let's see. It's as if somebody wanted her out of the house. Wouldn't leaving her in the house be more frightening to a family who received a threatening text? Yet there was, there, oh, I forgot to mention that. After she was murdered, apparently, somebody used her phone and sent a threatening text saying, hey, 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 you know. Uh, she, she deserved this and well, I forgot what the text said, but basically saying this is more to come or something like, it. you know, just I look what I've done type of thing, um, which is a really weird text as well. Um, how did the killer know that the duffel bag could be used? 
I looked it up and it looks like a piece of luggage with handles. Um, now, what's, what's, what's very weird about this whole thing, again, okay, let's say you, you're in the house having this, you get in the house somehow and you're having an argument with her. I mean, I, I have a hard time believing she got stabbed that many times with defense wounds to her hands and she just went, ooh, 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 ooh. I'm gonna say she was screaming and she's on the first floor. She's shrieking. Now, maybe her 13 year old son was under headphones and didn't hear anything. This is where the, uh, the interrogation comes in or the interview. Police bring him down, they interview him and say, what were you doing? If he was totally under headphones, he might not have heard anything. But you would think also the person who's in the house they could have believed she was alone, but did did they know she was al- uh, Did they think she was alone? Did they know that the thirteen year olds in the house? Because once you've killed somebody and done all that work, it's a lot more work to then sh- have to find the duffel bag, shovel them into the duffel bag, and then remove them and take the chance of dragging them all the way down the street to a park. Of course, they did such a shitty job that. <laughs> You know, they left the trail all the way back to the house. So, you, you know, you know who it was, you know where it happened. And it's like, you would think that if somebody just got in there and got mad at her and stabbed her, they just get the heck out of there. Why the removal of the body? And there's u- usually the reason for the removal of a body is either they've left specific evidence on the body they don't want found, or they don't, they are connected to that person. And by removing the person from the house, they're indicating that I am not involved. Uh, so those are, those are usually the reasons for doing those things. Uh, yeah, uh, th- yeah, they had a. The, oh, the, oh, that's what I was looking for. I was looking at the model with wheels. Yes, and and they had two. The, they had two boys, and who were obviously involved in sports, and they had these bags in the house. Um, but you know, the question again is, where were these bags at? Who would know where these bags were? Um, so. <sighs> well, that is a question. How could the killer know the husband and older son were away? I don't know. How do they know that there wasn't somebody still in the house? Uh, maybe they thought she was home alone and the third, uh, the other kid wasn't there. Possible. But then again, why bother to take her body out of the house? It's, it's you know, you take a body out of the house when you, if you strangle somebody, that works really better because, you know, you haven't left blood there. So then you put them in the bag and get them the hell out of the house, dump them somewhere, hopefully someplace far away. Like you put them in a car and you drive them to a national park. You put them in a, you know, a nice little, uh, you know, ditch there, uh, throw some leaves over them. And then you say, I came home, my wife is missing. You know, because you don't have a body in the house. You don't have evidence of a death in a the house. Then you, then you could say, oh, she went, she went, she left the house. I, I saw her leave the house. She went for a walk and she never came back. That's a good reason to take the body out of the house. But taking a body out of a house is a lot of work. As one can see, as he's, the person is dragging, <laughs> dragging her in this, in this, this suit, this luggage thingy. I mean, it's, it's very strange. Um, um, oh, this is, I will, I will say this. Just because the husband wasn't away doesn't mean he wasn't involved. That is actually true. One always has to, maybe she was having an affair with the killer and he knew everything. Um, she had had an affair with somebody and that may be their suspect. Um, it is also possible, and I, I think that's reasonable to point out, that, as Lisa said, um, just because he, the husband was out of town doesn't mean he could not be involved in what happened. You always have to look at the possibility of hiring somebody to do somebody in. Um, I think the weird, the weird thing about that would be is the husband knows a 13 year old is home. And I just don't think that, you know, having somebody come in the house and stab your wife that many times when your child is in the house is probably not the way you'd have it done, (laughs) you know, but I think that's a good, it's always, you always have to look at that possibility and not just say, Oh, they weren't there. Therefore they're totally innocent. No, you always have to say, could they have? Because uh, she apparently had an affair. And I'm not going to say their marriage wasn't hunky-dory, uh, you know, even though the Facebook photos are great. Um, and, uh, that may be true. 
That may be true. Apparently, she was like hanging out in a bar on the way home from wherever she was. She went to, um, I guess, some musical concert, and then she stopped at the local bar and hung out there for a while, and then came home. I don't know. Ah, da, da, da. What were the, what were they implying? I don't know what they're implying uh, at this point. But I I think the interesting thing about this case is is the is the body being dragged from the home, uh, and usually that means that the person involved is the person who is in the home with the person they killed. So I understand why they took the 13 year old out in handcuffs because even though he's a young boy, 13 can be a pretty big boy and we have not, won't be the first time we've had a mother killed by her, her teenage son um, in a rage. I understand why they took him out. I don't, they took him back. I don't know whether he is a person of interest because of this odd thing of the body being removed from the home. And they, they, they say that he they supposedly, reportedly said he hadn't left the home that night. I don't know, they might have video that proves that, that he didn't leave the home. I don't know if they do have video that proves that. He might have said he didn't leave the home. I still wonder why he didn't hear anything if he was at home, but again, maybe. Maybe he's just playing too many video games and he didn't hear a damn thing. He's in his room and he's, no. This is why it's so important for the police. They have to do a systematic investigation. But removing a body from a home usually means, usually, that the person who did it is also a resident of the home. Um, huh. Well, this, okay, this is another interesting point. <sighs> didn't, think the, didn't the killer think, wow, no one will see me? You, you you wonder about the, the the intelligence level of this particular person um, that they would think they weren't wouldn't be seen hauling along this body for as long as he hauled along the body that no blood would then come out of the luggage bag leaving the trail all the way to the park and back this is either a teen who doesn't have that much awareness yet or somebody who's really low IQ, you know what I mean? It's just, just not very bright. Seriously, not very bright. Um, I don't know about that handyman. I don't, I don't know what his issues were, but yeah. So, uh, that's how a kid thinks. Suspicious to me too. Um, I don't know. I'm looking forward to seeing who they finally come up with because um, I say it's extremely rare for anybody to remove a body from the home who actually is not involved in living in that home. Uh, unless they specifically know they kidnap somebody is one thing. Abducting somebody from a home, that's different. Uh, they're taking them someplace to enjoy killing them and raping, raping them. But if you're just killing somebody in a rage, you should just run away, you know, because first of all, first of all, you know, if you're, if you're stabbing, stabbing somebody up, chances of your, your DNA might be around or whatever, it might just be in the room anyway. So unless you're going to clean everything up, clean the living hell out of the room just because you know because then you got to put the body in the bag you got to be moving bodies around and putting things you know but, but you know, that just seems like a whole hell of a lot of work when you could just run away but maybe you can't run away probably not <laughs> almost never i mean i see this all the time it's like oh it's a small person it must be a woman uh, very very rare um again why would this person be in her home she came home late at night mind you she had been out for the evening, stopped at a bar for like 45 minutes or something like that, came home, I think it was near midnight. Who the hell was there at that time? I mean, I mean, maybe maybe a lover and waiting for her to come home and they got in an argument, or maybe the 13-year-old son who was definitely in the home. Hmm, I don't know, very interesting. Now that's a good, there is a, hey, Molly got a good point. Oh, I think the text said something like, don't call the police, <laughs> which sounds like a juvenile. Yeah, who, yeah, that's always kind of like foolish. Um, th but this is a point Anne makes. Maybe the killer was drunk. Maybe. But usually drunks just run away. I mean, it's easier. It's just easier. Must be. It's of. Okay, now you sound. <laughs> um, I can't understand you, Anne. You're sounding like that journalist in the article. <laughs> Must be it's of fingerprints. Um, worried about fingerprints on. That's an, you know, that's another interesting thing, which I wonder, um, because, well, first of all, where did the weapon come from, the stabby weapon? Um, 
And secondly, did they leave fingerprints on? Did, was a weapon left there? Was a weapon taken? Are there fingerprints on the weapon? Did the person use gloves? That would be different. Um, yeah, there's so much in here. Oh, maybe it's lots of fingerprints. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. <laughs> um, uh, I want to know how this person knew she was home. Don't know. Uh, again, because if it was her son, because he's home. Uh, if it wasn't her son, it was one of these other men. Uh, they can't, could have come home with her. You know, they could have. Or if they had a key to the house, they could have been lying in wait. That's possible. For whatever reasons, uh, I'm gonna, you know, I'll meet you at home later type of thing. Your husband's out of town. Uh, and then something went wrong. But I just don't understand the removal of the body from the home unless you are the person living in the home. <clears throat> Again, um, I don't know whether the basement had a basement door because because here's the thing if he if, if she was on the first floor you know, how did this work hold on a second hold on a second let me go back here a second that she was attacked on the first floor before being taken into the basement only reason i can think of going into the basement is to remove her from a basement door because it's harder if you go out the front of the house with the with the body it's it's not as easy but if you have a basement door you can sneak out of I don't know yet because I don't, I haven't heard all these details of the crime. Um, so yeah, <laughs> Lisa, welcome from New Zealand. Oh, I keep saying New Zealand, New Zealand, right? I keep, keep messing that made it. Hi, everyone. Don't know so, but what it's about. You'll have to review on that. Cause I'm, I'm about finished. I'm about finished with that one. I'm going to move on to the next one. The, the husband was very far away. So he, he wasn't there personally to kill her off. <laughs> it's, wait, at least it's about a stabbing in a hockey bag. <laughs> Pretty good. All right. All right. I'm going to move on from there because let's just wait and see who they finally come up. They say they have suspects and I'm going to say if it's a son, it's not going to be that hard to put, you no, know, do something with him. If it's one of the men in her life that are not her husband, which is so really kind of weird, um, then I, we just have to see whether they find that person and then why that person would take the body out of the house, which I say just it's so weird. It's just so really, really weird. OK, so now say so now they say here they um, here they do say the ex handyman lover. So it was the handyman that was the lover. Maybe he was hot, you know, maybe he's like strong, you know what I mean? Had a had a body on him, you know, um, I had one of those guys at my house once. The mur he was a he was a felon came to do my roofing he'd been in prison for many years for murder psychopath hot as hell <laughs> i did not have an affair with him <laughs> but you know he did a lot of a lot of work around the house gutters and stuff and he had he had a body let's put it that way so maybe she just you know <laughs> what can i say okay now, um, let, let me let me go on. Let me go to the two that I was asked to talk about um, before I forget to talk about them. These are the two uh, cases: the Burger Chef murders and the uh, the other one, the um, yogurt shop murders. Okay, um, so I was asked to do those two cases, and I, I read up on them to determine whether I was going to do an entire show. And I realized I can't do an entire show on either one of them. Now. People might always wonder why I won't do that. They're like, well, I know I've seen like five different videos, you know, um, and they're like hour long videos on these, these, these uh, cases. Why won't you do them? Well, the difference between me and them is they're telling a story and they don't have to analyze anything. They're just going to tell a, a story, what happened, show pictures and make, it's just telling you an interesting story. I don't do stories. I mean, they do stories and, there's, you know, I'm a profile. It's not my purpose to tell stories. I have to do analysis. The question comes down to, is there anything to an analyze or am I just, am I just going to repeat what they do? And quite frankly, they do it better. They tell stories better than I tell stories, you know? Uh, so no, I don't, I don't do that. I have to analyze. So what I'm looking for is, is there anything interesting to say about these cases? Um, so let me just tell you what I'm going to talk about on Friday and on Sunday. On Friday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, I'm going to do my Asia, Asia Oceana show, and I'm going to do the 30-year-old case of the body under the toilet. This is a Japanese case that this young man uh, ended up curled up underneath 
a, to a, a toilet <laughs> underneath the ground in, in, in the piping, underneath a toilet. It's the most bizarre case ever. And I looked at that and thought, wow, that is just fascinating. So I've been analyzing that case. It's how did this man end up dead in this, this septic tank area underneath a, it's, it's a, a squat toilet that they have in, in Japan. Uh, and there's all kinds of weird theories about it. I mean, really weird theories. And I believe I have the closest thing to what might be actually true as to what happened, but what a weird case. I got something to say. Uh, the other one I'm going to do is on Sunday, I'm going to do Jimmy Savile because Netflix came out with their, their show on it, which I did see all of. Um, and I'm going to discuss his behaviors, what he is likely guilty of, what he is not guilty of, and what label he should get. Because I think people are a little bit wrong. I really believe they're a lot wrong on the label they're giving him. Uh, and this is based on evidence as opposed to a lot of conjecture um, and a lot of media, you know, hype. So, so tune in Friday night for a guy under a toilet <laughs> and Sunday for Jimmy Savile. Um, and these cases I've found something to talk about that takes up a whole show. But, but, all right. So that, so now I'm going to tell you about these two different cases and both of them involve stores that had four people at them at the time that the crimes went down and and all four people end up dead in both of these cases and they've both gone unsolved and um real real shame uh horrific cases involving young people um teenagers who are who are just doing their jobs in these two different stores these restaurants restaurants you know the yogurt place and this burger place and they're closing up for the night and both of them involved a robbery and in the case of the yogurt crime, there was also rape involved and arson and uh, real nasty stuff and never been solved. What is the problem why they're not solved? Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, so the yogurt shop murders happened in Austin. There were four beautiful young ladies who were killed in that one. And I have to admit, it's one of the most gruesome cases I've run into. Um, so there is a 48 hour show that just came out in 2022. Just recently, you can, um, go to, it's not on YouTube. So, um, if I can find it, I'll put the link below. It's a, but if you put in 48 hours yogurt shop, the, there is the full thing is on the internet. Um, so this was in 1991 in December, 17 year old Eliza Thomas, 13 year old Amy Ayers and two sisters, 17 year old Jennifer Harbison and 15 year old Sarah Harbison were tied up and shot in the head. All right, so two of the girls, the two older girls were working there that night. The two younger girls were meeting them and getting a ride home. So that's how that worked. Um, so, so they were getting ready to close. Uh, Jennifer's sister Sarah and, their friend, and her, their friend Amy met them there to head home. Investigators believe at least two men entered the shop and committed the brutal crime before setting the place on fire, destroying much of the evidence. And they used a cellar. And so, you know, they wiped that place out. Um, now, what eventually happened was they ended up arresting four guys. And they were four, like, teens. All right? Um, they had a suspicion about one of the guys originally because of, there were two guns used in the crime. So they believed there were at least two people. Um, and one girl was raped and not so sure about the others, but they know one was. Um, and... This guy that they caught originally, he had a 22 on him. He was in a nearby mall with a 22. Uh, and they could not match that gun to the scene. So they knew there was a 22 used, but they didn't have the, you know, the, the ballistics weren't going, were able to be done, shall we say, to match the two of them. Um, but they suspected him. And then he gave up other people that he said did it with him. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, he was arrested with a gun near the mall, uh, and then after they were questioned, but there was a, they were released for lack of evidence. However, in 1999, they re-questioned the men. Two of them confessed to the yogurt shop murders. One of them said he raped the girl, and they implicated the other two. All four men were subsequently arrested. All right, then they recanted. They went to court. They lost. They, they were convicted. All right. However, it was just the confessions that convicted them. 
And so they got out on a technicality eventually, um, years later, but like almost a decade later, but they got a technicality of some rights being not observed where one's confession was used against the other in court and vice versa, and that was a no-no. So they got out. Now, prosecutors, this is interesting, prosecutors intended to retry them. So because so much time had passed and DNA had improved, they ordered new DNA tests on vaginal swabs taken from the victims. All right. By this point, they come to believe that at least one of the victims had been sexually assaulted, and that's the one girl. Uh, and prosecutors want to take advantage of a fairly new type of DNA testing called RSTR testing. It searches for male DNA only. All right. So here's what happened. They got the testing done and they got a partial male DNA. All right. Partial does not necessarily exclude, uh, include anybody because many people can have the same piece as a partial thing. So no, they may have these, these markers, but they don't have, but these markers we, we don't know about. So you might have a portion of the population that matches these markers. And so you can't say somebody's guilty because his mar ma markers match. However, if they don't match at all, they're excluded. So it can be used to exclude. Well, they got screwed on this deal because <laughs> they did the DNA to convict these guys and it came back that it didn't match any of the four guys. <laughs> so now they're like, ah, crap. So anyway, that was the end of that. They've been released. Now, there's a lot of anger that they overfocused on these two guys, that they forced them into confessions um, and they didn't do it. That's the theory. The police still believe they're the, they're the right four guys. But where the heck is, where, where did this other DNA come from? The, the, the DNA comes from the youngest girl and according to everybody, no, she was not playing around before she got murdered. So that's a problem. Now they had, they had, did have a couple other suspects. They had three other guys. They had somebody there that looked like, um, that they looked, they, they did a sketch on and it matched these three guys that were, I think they were Mexican nationals. Anyway, they went to Mexico. Um, and the Me uh, they they were interviewed down there and and then it just kind of all they blew off they they didn't confess to anything and that was the end of that so we have these four guys that they convicted did they actually do it we got the three mexican national guys um did they do it and run away um or is it yet again somebody else completely different and you know here's the problem um I have no idea because I would literally have to go to Austin and sit down and study every piece of evidence and every police report and every, every interview before I could say this person did it because I don't know what the, what the, what the, um, how the interviews were conducted to the point of where they, where they pushed into saying things that weren't true. I don't know what happened with the Mexican guys, you know, um, it's a very vicious, very aggressive crime. Um, four teenagers plan this crime to rob the place and then kill the girls, rape and kill, um, and use accelerant. They'd have that's a pretty big plan. Um, they they seem a little young for that to me. I would think they would be the older guys. When so the the, the three Mexican dudes probably. And they were, the, those guys, by the way, were criminals. <laughs> yeah. And I think it has more of a ring of, of actual criminals. So the guys that matched that description that were criminals and went to Mexico, they had violent behavior. And I would, and there were three of them, it would work, but I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, so the police are still trying to figure it out. 48 Hours just did a thing on it and... I don't know whether they just, you know, I don't know if they mucked up the investigation and, and looked the wrong way or they just couldn't get the evidence because of the arson. I honestly do not know. Uh, so I have to leave it at that because that's why I can't do a whole show on it. And it's, and it's a sad, sad crime of these four girls getting murdered. But sometimes, you know, unless you can actually figure out where things might have gone wrong, if they did, you, you can't truly... Uh, uh, analyze it very well. Yeah, I can tell the story, but I couldn't analyze it. So that was where I just left that. I don't know which group of people did it. Um, wish I did. Wish I wish they did, you know, and 10 people, 10, these four guys spent 10 years in prison. Um, so did they do it? Or were they wrongly in prison? Mm. 
One of them actually, after he got out, I guess, and ended up with a scuffle with a police officer and ended up getting shot, reasonably so. <laughs> so they weren't great guys, let me put it that way. No, nobody who was like in, interviewed was like cream of the you know crop community. You know, that wasn't what they were. Let me tell you about the Burger Chef murders. This I can say a little bit more on, um, and there, there's a there's a reason I can say a little more on this, but not conclusively again for for any purposes of doing a full show. The Burger Chef murders took place at a Burger Chef restaurant in Speed. Does anybody remember Burger Chef? It, it rings a bell to me. 1978. This was in Speedway, Indiana. I know Burger King, obviously, but Burger Chef does ring a bell. And I'm wondering because I would be in, I would have been in my 20s. Maybe I ran into a Burger Chef. I don't know. Um, anyway, what happened there was four young employees went missing. This was what was really bizarre about this crime. With the Austin yogurt ones, they did what normally they do. Kill them right there, leave the bodies there. In this case, they just you know, threw some accelerant on and burned the place up so they kill you know, evidence. Um, in this case, the four young employees went missing. So this is a very bizarre crime. Um, they initially thought it was a petty theft of cash from the restaurant safe. Now, the restaurant safe is an interesting point here. By Saturday morning, it became clear, a clear case of robbery kidnapping. And by Sunday, when their bodies were discovered, a case of murder. All right. Now, investigators believe they have identified some or all of the perpetrators, but without the physical evidence, they have not been able to prosecute those who remain alive. All right. Now, things went wrong in this case, and this is, this is where... Uh, there's a lot of anger again about the police investigation and how they handled it. But I understand why they did what they did. At some point between 11 p.m., which is closing, and midnight, uh, and on November 17th, 1978, four, four employees of the Burger Chef restaurant disappeared. Assistant manager Jane Freed, Freed, she's 20 years old. She was the assistant manager, and she was, I think she was the one who would probably have access to the safe. Because you got to put the money away, I would assume the assistant manager is it. And she's 20. Also, Daniel Davis, 16, Mark Fleming, 16, and Ruth Ellen Shel Shelton, 18. Those were the employees. A fellow employee who came by at midnight to visit the four noticed that the restaurant was empty, the money safe was open, and the back door ajar. Police found two empty currency bags and an empty roll of adhesive tape next to the, next to the open safe. Now... You would think they'd go, oh my God, there's been a robbery. That's not what happened. They did not consider the case to be serious, given that the management reported the loss of only approximately 581 US dollars. Now, mind you, this is, this is back of then. It's now worth $2,400. I'm gonna say $2,400 is not minor to certain people. Now, I love it when people say, oh, well, they didn't take hardly any money. Well, you know, if you're working a regular job and you know, you're working on Wall Street and you can make $2,400 in half a week, no, it's it's a chump, you know, chump change. But if you don't have any money, $2,400 buys you a lot of shit. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> so, um, hi, Christine. We're so happy to have Christine back, by the way. <laughs> Christine went missing, but now she's back. Um, and I'm happy to have you here, Christine. Yeah, you can go back and there's a couple, couple cases before, uh, but, you know, you'll catch up. And I'm doing the Burger, Burger Chef case right now. So they thought, oh, this is a petty theft. Well, I'm going to say again, $2,000 worth, something worth $2,400 is not that petty to a lot of people. Um, there were no clear signs of a struggle. That's interesting. It was thought to be that what they thought they had done, get this, that the, I guess that the assistant manager who ran the place opened up the safe and then all of them, the four of them, used the money to go partying. Really? That is a very strange determination to make when you see that. Oh, look, they stole, they borrowed, what, they borrowed the money? No, they, they stole the money to go partying. Well, all four of them would be unemployed the next morning. They'd be arrested for theft. Really? That's what you thought? So I don't know who thought that and if it's even true, but that, that's ridiculous. Um, but because they left more than a hundred dollars in coins in the register. Well, okay. So they didn't, somebody didn't take anything. So that meant it wasn't a thief. Okay. Maybe somebody just want to carry around a hundred dollars worth of coins, you know, um, 
Now get this. Although the purses and jackets of the missing women have been left at the shop. So women go out without their purses, right? They go out partying for the night. They take the money. What they do, shove it down their underwear. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm going to say they took their purses. If they left their purses, there's something seriously wrong. Um, so anyway, they thought that was the most likely thing that happened. Oh. Ah, just I point this out over and over again. Sometimes detectives do not get training, especially in certain areas of the country where they do not have, you know, training, any kind of training. They just go from the street to detective, and that's that. And they, and if you get a you get a guy or two in there who are just illogical as hell, this is what happens. Might be the most well-meaning guys in the world, but they're like, oh, I think they just ran around for the night having fun partying. Oh God, no, I'm a ter terrible analysis by these guys. Terrible. So anyway, because of that. The employees came in early on uh, early uh, Saturday morning and cleaned the whole place up. <laughs> got rid of all the fingerprints, got rid of anything because they cleaned it all up. Um, clearly, there was not blood in there. So that's not what they cleaned, but they got rid of anything else. So anyway, so what happened was Buddy Elwanger, a Speedway police officer, was eventually assigned to the case. He wasn't a detective. He's a police officer. Okay. Hmm. Admitted. We screwed it up from the beginning. <laughs> yes, you did. Uh, not only was the restaurant cleaned and allowed to be reopened, no photographs were taken beforehand, effectively eliminating all potential evidence at the crime scene. When the four didn't show up on Saturday morning and the assistant manager, her car was found partially, partially locked in town. What the heck is partially locked? It is locked or not locked. <laughs> What's partially locked even mean? I don't know who wrote that one. Concerns grew. It became evident that they had been abducted while closing the store for the night. Yes, the restaurant. Uh, with the attack possibly beginning as they removed trash bags out the back door. On Sunday afternoon, the hi hikers found the body of the four over 20 miles away in the rural, in rural woods. Uh, both Davis and Shelton had been shot execution style. Numerous times with a 38 caliber firearm. Freet, that's the assistant manager, had been stabbed twice in the chest and the handle of the knife broke off and was missing. The blade was recovered during the autopsy. It's quite nasty. And the Flemings um, was later determined to have been bludgeoned, possibly with a chain, and died from choking to death on his own blood. All four victims were still wearing their Burger Chef uniforms. You know, when you go partying, Burger Chef uniforms don't get you a date. Um, <laughs> you want to change out of those things, you know. Money, uh, here's another, oh gosh, another stupid analysis. Money and watches were found on the dead victims, implying that robbery might not have been the sole motive for the murder. Can anybody, do, I'm going to stop here, just let you jump in here. Why do you think that is a really stupid analysis? Uh, they were found with money and watches. What can, and this means it might, robbery might not be the motive because the robbers didn't take their watches and their money. Can anybody want to chime in here and say, what, 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 what's the problem with that? Uh, there's a bunch of problems with that. Actually, there's a bunch of, I'm trying to teach profiling here. So that's why, that's one of the things I'm trying to do more is get you all involved so that you can actually practice profiling and, and, and analysis. So I'm, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for all the answers to come in. <laughs> come on guys. You're, you're a great team here. I, I, I know you are. You came up with good ones on the last crime, so um, let's start with the watches. Why didn't they take the watches? <laughs> well, Christine, honesty, I have no clue. Apparently the police didn't either. <laughs> so you're not alone. <laughs> you're not alone. Start with the watches. Why didn't they take those watches from the teenagers? Think about it. If anybody here is as old as me and you're in the 70s, what kind of watch did you wear? A teenage kid who works at Burger Chef. We're not talking about a teenage kid who uh, is going to the, uh, the, 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 the uh, country club. Well, that's, that is, and that's one. Okay, they already robbed the safe and got $2,500. They don't need watches. They use, no, this is 1978. There are no such thing as iPhones. <laughs> 
but they did have that's but the first part is correct they already had twenty five hundred dollars it's a swatch watch i don't even know what a swatch watch is is that the one with that is that the one with like the uh the um like fabric hand the fabric wristband waist wristband right wristband is that what I, that that is uh and this is another good point they panicked and took took off close close so i think we're, we're, we're getting in on the two major three major reasons they didn't take the watches there we go thank you molly cheap watches <laughs> I know that I had what well, I think they were Timex or something and like like they had that like I mean you know I'm, a lot of kids if they had a watch unless they had if maybe if you graduate from high school and you were given a watch as a graduation present it might be slightly better but quite frankly uh fingerprints no that would be a reason to take them um no mostly cheap watches if they, they weren't wearing Rolexes, you know what I mean? They got $2,500, they're gonna go, oh man, I gotta really need this watch. I don't know that these kids even wore a watch, and if they wore a watch, it was not a $10 watch and wasn't worth the effort. That's number one. Uh, number two, if you got $2,500, you know, it simply may not even ring. The third reason is they just shot and stabbed them and their, their bodies are in the woods. They just may not, they just committed a, a multiple homicide. Maybe it's just time to leave. You know what I mean? They might not really want to overfocus on, man, I got to get those wristwatches off of their little hands. So, yep, that's it. See, Timex is not Rolexes. Exactly. Not worth anything if they worked at a burger joint. Exactly. We're not talking about the country club kids here. We're talking about kids probably who are you know, trying to earn a, a, a small amount of money so they can, you know, get their first job, go to college eventually. They, they know they're not wearing Rolexes. Um, now, why didn't they take the money from their pockets? This is, they had money on them. Oh my God. What about the money they had on them? First of all, <laughs> two of them, let's see, what, 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 what did we read here? Uh, the purses and jackets of the missing women. Where were they? They were in the restaurant. Uh, apparently left there when they were committing this crime of uh, whatever, you know, grabbing the money out of the safe and, and abducting people. And what's the main reason why probably they didn't take the money that might have been in a pocket of one of the two guys or some of the money that might have been in the purses? What's, what's another reason? Just like the watches. What do you think? How much money do you think these kids had on them? <laughs> you know what I mean? How much money? They didn't take the money out of the register, you know, because they probably didn't want to waste the time. They already had $2,500 and open the, carry all this change. What, you're going to go in the pocket? Oh, my God, I got three more dollars, you know. The kids had very little money. Exactly. Most likely they had very little money unless it was payday and all four picked up a paycheck of $100 or something. They probably had no money worthwhile. So the first mistake they made was assuming that these kids <laughs> leaving the watches behind in their coats would break into a, no, no, it didn't break into it. She would open the safe and allow the four of them would all steal together. It had to be all four criminals and none of them cared about their jobs. Well, all four criminals to go out and party so much at 12 o'clock at night too, you know, 12 o'clock at night. So they're all starting awful late to party. Where are they, where are they partying at that age? Because like two of them are underage. Where are they partying with this money? And then they're gonna get arrested, lose their jobs and end up in jail. So that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And then, oh no, maybe it's something else because that maybe more than a rob wasn't really a robber about a robbery because they left these cheap watches on a couple of the kids and they had an extra five bucks in their pocket. <laughs> this is just uh, really, really bad analysis. Um, so anyway, let's see what else happened. So the leading theory was the four victims were kidnapped during a botched robbery. Okay. There clearly was a robbery. We know that. Um, the botched part, the question is, how is it botched? Possibly after one of the victims recognized one of the perpetrators. Now, this is interesting. Flemons. This is one of the boys was covering for another employee's shift and was not scheduled to work that night. Leading investigators to speculate that perhaps he was the one who recognized the killers since they had not planned on him being there. That's an interesting point. Maybe that's true. And they came in, they thought they're going to just rob the place, you know, hold up a gun. They're going to get the money, uh, to, you know, and then they would be able to identify him. And then this guy goes, Hey, Joe, what are you doing here with that gun? <laughs> and then all goes to hell after that. So that is 
that's the best analysis that they did in this whole this whole thing that's interesting now i think there's something more here on the night of the murders uh, okay so let's see so people are saying who might have done it later that year a man in a bar bragged that he was involved uh, they did a polygraph he passed so they didn't bring any charges um, he gave some names of others he suggested belonged to a fast food robbery gang uh, and they kind of did want to, and they didn't get anywhere with this. They got confessions, but they, they got, you know, they're confessions again. Um, but they had a lot of confessions by many people and, um, there was no physical evidence. So they didn't get anybody. Uh, they would, wouldn't have been helpful if they found the gun. So anyway, now what happened later on, and this is, this is where I'm going to point out what may have happened. All right. So anyway, the bearded suspect that once upon a time here, they had two suspects and one of them committed suicide and now they had a heart attack. So they had no idea. Yeah, maybe not any of them. So anyway, here's where the one possibility is. They were in 1984. They received a call from an inmate at the Pendleton Correctional Facility named Donald Forrester, who was serving a 95 year prison sentence for rape. Forrester claimed to have been involved in the murders and was willing to confess in order to avoid his scheduled transfer to a notoriously violent state prison. At first, the call seemed promising as Forrester was a career criminal who was living in Speedway at the time when the murders took place, and he was not in jail at that time. Um, he then led the police to the crime scene in the woods, where he accurately described the location and position of the dead bodies when, when they were found. He also knew about the broken handle of the knife, which was not widely publicized. Notice the word widely. <laughs> this is like the partially locked car. No, it's locked or it's not locked. It's publicized or it's not publicized. Widely, I don't even know what that means. Um, so he also knew about the knife. Um, let's see, where, where are we at here? Um, oh, according to Forrester, Freed's brother, that's the girl who was the assistant manager. Her brother, he said her brother James owed money on a drug deal. So he and three other associates, I always love the word associates, Three, he and three other criminals <laughs> went to the restaurant to threaten her. But when Flemons, that's the boy that was there for the first time, intervened to protect Freet, a fight broke out during which Flemons fell and hit his head on the bumper of a car. Believing Flemons was dead or dying, Forrester and his accomplices decided to abduct and kill the employees to eliminate all the witnesses to their crime. He gave names of three men. Uh, led them to the spot where he had thrown the gun in the river, but they didn't find the gun. Uh, they interviewed the ex-wife, who said that days after the murder, Forrester had driven her out to a wooded area where he left her in the car and got out to retrieve several firearm shell casings off the ground. He had then driven back home and flushed the casings down the toilet. Thirty. Uh, uh, so they went to his house, and it was somebody else lived there, but they got a warrant, and the search turned up several spent 38 caliber shell casings. So they got, they didn't say if they were in the toilet though, in the sept, oh, they got the sept, they did search the septic tank and that's where they were. Um, however, after someone in the sheriff's department leaked details of Forrester's cooperation, he suddenly recanted his confession and claimed it was coerced. With no further cooperation from Forrester and no direct evidence because, you know, they didn't get the gun. Um, Forrester was never charged and he died in prison of cancer in 2006. All right, so that's where it all ended up, and nobody's ever been charged. Now, here's the question. Um, the guy that confessed and led them to these places, again, we have to wonder, was he in any way, not so much coerced, but was he led to those places, and then, you know, in other words, he was fed the information, and that's, then he repeated the information. That's always a question, unless everything is very carefully done where you've got recordings of every single moment. You just don't know. Well, we're going to take you to the woods. Where did it happen? Did it happen over there, there, or how about here? You know, we don't know what happened because they want to close the case. Um, so he supposedly knew all these things. Um, it's interesting that the wife said they, the wife is the most interesting part that they went to the woods and he retrieved those, the casings. Um, I'm not sure when he would have retrieved the casings and how he'd know if the bodies are gone exactly where the casings were that's and why the police didn't find the casings because it wouldn't I guess they didn't they didn't do a proper job there either and didn't look for the casings um so then and, and they found the casings in the septic tank like the wife said so that to me is the most interesting part um 
So do I think that could be the guy and his whatever accomplices, associates, <laughs> accomplices? Um, all right. And what happened? I, I think it's very possible he was the guy. Um, I don't know who he named his accomplices, but uh, no, this case is never going to be tried in a court of law. It's dead in the water. Um, but what actually happened? And I have a theory on that. Let me see. Um, let's see. All that death for a few hundred or a few thousand dollars. Well, you know, you, those kind of people, psychopathic people, really don't think that, it, you know, those people's lives mattered anyway especially if they can get a few thousand bucks. Um, yes, Fed, uh, this is, well, he didn't want to go to the, the worst facility. So he was willing to confess. The question is, were the police willing to let him confess and encourage and give him information so they could close a case because everybody cooperates here. Is that, is that what was going on? Um, okay, so, all right. Here's what I want to point out. Yes, one person kind of accidentally killed, so we need to murder three additional. Hard to comprehend. I don't buy that. I don't buy the accidentally killed thing at all. Uh, so supposedly, now first of all, get this part. The guy says they went to the restaurant because the brother owed money and they were going to threaten his sister, the assistant manager. Garbage. You know, if you want to threaten her, you don't go into a place of business with witnesses and threaten her there. That's the stupidest thing ever. It's not like she's not going to go home or drive around or go other places. You can grab her any place and threaten her. Um, here's what I think happened. Maybe the brother, and I, I don't know what the police investigated as far as the brother owing money. Let's say the brother did owe money. The brother might have said, hey, I can't pay you, but if you go to the burger chef, my sister, when it closes, my sister you know, can empty the safe for you. I don't know that brother wasn't a piece of scum and, and, and basically thought, I'll just, I'll just tell them where to get the money and then they'll leave me alone. Not thinking maybe his sister was going to get killed. They were just going to rob the place. That's what I think happened. I think they, they, they had been given a tip as to exactly when it was going on and who had control and all this stuff. I think the brother ratted out his sister. That's just the best scenario I can come up with for why they went there. Uh, then when they got there, they clearly, she clearly did open the safe because they got the money, right? So they got the money. Then what happened? Now, I don't know. I, did, I couldn't, couldn't hear anything here. Whether Well, we don't know if they wore masks because the, everybody there who was a witness is dead. So the claim that one of the, that Fleming um, recognized one of them and therefore he could rat him out, I don't know, maybe they didn't wear any masks and so yet that is exactly what happened. Or maybe they did wear masks and Fleming tried to, maybe, maybe tried to stop the robbery. Who knows? But I don't think he accidentally fell <laughs> and hit his head on a bumper. I don't think that's enough for them to start to decide to abduct and kill everybody. I'm gonna say that he was pretty much, they attacked him there. They said he was beaten with a chain um, and I don't know whether there was blood in, outside any place in the bushes or they hit him with a chain and then strangled. I don't know exactly what happened. I believe they killed one of them, straight up murder right outside the place or in the place. And then they had three witnesses to murder. And then they said, screw it. T let's just take them all and get rid of them. I believe that's what happened. Um, yeah, poor, poor kid, poor kid that filled in. Oh, the uh, next time somebody says, can you take my shift? Go, no, no, I don't want your shift. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, poor kid. Yeah, I'm really, really sad. I mean, um, I don't know. Uh, you know, there's nothing I can prove here, but I just, I just, I just feel like there's something more here. And that story about they're going to threaten her made no sense. But the, the possibility of the brother telling them to go get the money from the safe makes more sense to me. Um, and, of course, how much... The guy, how much, you know, when, when psychopaths tell you a story, they don't always tell you the, the actual story for reasons that they don't want. Well, we don't even know what their reasons are. There might be a reason. Um, maybe it would lead to the other accomplices and then definitely would come back on you. I don't know. You know, I don't know because I'm also, I, I can't see the police reports. And I'm going to say they probably suck anyway, but uh, <laughs> I just don't know. Um, but I thought it was... Um, it's gang. Oh, that's a that's an interesting point. That's a gang. It's gang related. If 
a, a chain was used. Um, and it may be, uh, you know, I, I don't know that the, the, the robber itself, there might have been a drug, drug selling gang uh, at the time. Uh, I don't know who these people are. I don't know what they were attached to. I don't know what criminal record they had prior to this all going down. Um, you know, I don't because there's not enough information on the internet. Uh, but yeah, there could have been a, a, a gang that sold drugs and then this guy owed him money and they went and he ratted out a sister and he, they went there to get the money and all hell broke loose and they ended up being murderers and four innocent kids got killed. Really sad. Really, really sad. Um, but yeah, change, change do tend to be more gangish, you know, unless there just happened to be a chain hanging around there. And you never know, maybe it closed a fence or and it was just available, but they did have guns too, so, and, and a big fat knife. And I don't know where the knife came from either. And why they stabbed her. That's an interesting issue as well. Um, the problem is we don't know what, because of the cleaning of the restaurant, maybe there really was some blood there, but nobody paid any attention, thought it was a, you know, beef juice or something on the floor, beef blood on the floor, and just cleaned it up. So maybe she got stabbed right there. You know, it's possible. Um, Maybe she went for the, maybe she let them into the safe and then went for the telephone to try to call the police and they stabbed her to stop her talking. That may also be what started all of this. So maybe she was actually the catalyst because she went to call the police um, and didn't make it to the phone. You know, we don't know. Absolutely don't know because they screwed the whole crime scene up. At least they admit they screwed the crime scene up. <laughs> I'll give them credit on that one. Um, so I thought that was just real. Those are my two takes on those cases. I say that... Burger Chef, at least I have more to say than the other one, but um, I just thought it was really interesting, but it can't go any more than that, so I didn't want to uh, do a whole show on it. Um, let's see. Oh, so I'm going to end this with bodies in the swimming pool. Um, bodies in the swimming pool. Uh, the, the reason I came up with this was, why did I come up with this? Uh, oh, I think I was watching... Or maybe Hawaii Five O, because that's kind of my new love is Hawaii Five O, the original one, not the new one that sucks. Uh, but the original one has really good detective work, really nice stories, and uh, I kind of think what's his name is hot. But anyway, um, but the the thing about the the swimming pool, which I just thought was really fascinating, because I thought, you know, there's a lot of truth in this. All right, let me find let me find the thing about. All right, bodies. Oh. Oh, no, 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 that's not where I came up with this. Um, uh, this was actually from the uh, uh, Adam Walsh thing. Because remember, Adam Walsh's head was found. This was what I did last Sunday. If you haven't seen the video, go check it out. My, my take on Adam Walsh and who killed Adam Walsh. His, his head was found in a canal. And one of the reasons they said they believed that um, Otis Toole had done it was because of the way he described the head in the canal. I believe the issue was he said it sunk. He threw the head in and it sunk. And he, they said, oh, you know, if he, didn't, if he didn't watch that, he wouldn't know that it would sink. He would, they, you know, he would just say, they threw it in and it rolled around and floated around in the canal. Ha ha. Well, first of all, Otis Toole may have thrown other things in a canal. So <laughs> he may know that from lots of experience, not just because he saw that one thing. So I'm not buying that. But the issue was about the thing float, uh, sinking. Now, here's, here's what I noted. I've been watching different, you know, different shows and uh, like um, uh, Death in Paradise, which unfortunately just the season's over and I do love that show. And then uh, there's a few other crime shows I watch. And you, oftentimes you'll have somebody who's murdered and they're found floating in the swimming pool, right? So they, they're floating in the swimming pool like somebody comes out and goes, ah! because they see the body floating in the swimming pool, right? And usually the body, they find that out like maybe an hour after it happened or maybe maybe it is a whole night has gone by, but they're floating in the pool in the morning. So they're this, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> Jack Lord, yes. <laughs> what do you mean, not Jack Lord? Yeah, Jack Lord, I think he's kind of cute. Okay. <laughs> I don't know something about him, uh, but I do. I, I do like the original Jack Lord. Um, it's just uh, I like his way of doing things. I mean, it's just I think it's a brilliantly written show. And I even looked up who wrote it because most of the shows I see that are police procedurals, they don't throw me very much. But this is, I think, the most intelligent police procedural I've ever watched. 
and they, they use a lot more thinking than they do fancy crap because it's from way, way back. But, uh, and it's in Hawaii and I love Hawaii. So I'll, I watch it mostly because it's also Hawaii. So and it's just a happy thing for me just to lay up at night and watch the show. So anyway, bodies and water. So you see these in these movies. Oh my God, you know, she's found floating in the pool. She's floating in the pool. He's floating in the pool. Here's what's interesting. What happens when you throw a body in the pool? Okay, so this is a, uh, this is a, a site I found about this. Okay, so what happens is when you throw the body in the pool, it sinks like a rock to the bottom of the pool. How often do you see a show where the person's at the bottom of the pool instead of floating in the water, right? And, and I just don't know why they do that. I don't know if it's because they don't know the science behind it or because they just think it looks cool. It has somebody floating. You can just chuck the, chuck the actor in and make them float. They can't, you know, they, they can't keep the person on the bottom long enough to do the shot. <laughs> I don't know what the issue is, but listen to this. Okay, so, so this, it's this. So the cadaver in the body starts to sink as soon as the air in its lungs is replaced by water. So it's, it's the air that keeps you up. So as soon as you start sucking in the water, you're just a big, huge, heavy thing with no air in you. And you, it sinks straight to the bottom. Once submerged, the body stays underwater until the bacteria in the gut and chest cavity produce enough gas methane, hydrogen sulfide, and carbon dioxide to float it to the surface like a balloon. That's when they go, they start blowing up, right? All right, the buildup of methane, hydro hydrogen sulfide, and other gases can take days or weeks, depending on a number of factors. At first, not all parts of the body inflate the same amount. This is very pleasant, isn't it? I know, this is very pleasant. The most, uh, okay, okay, the torso, which contains the most bacteria, bloats more than the head and limbs. The most buoyant part, body parts rise first, leaving the head and limbs to drag behind the chest and abdomen. Since arms, legs, and the head can only drape forward from the body, they drape forward, not backwards, forward. Then what happens is the corpses tend to rotate so that the torso floats face down with arms and legs hanging beneath it. That's what you see. Says so most bodies, dead bodies float this way, but there are a few exceptions. Only if they're really small, then they might float, float the other way because they got little short arms. I think I'm talking about children. Um, they, they won't drag so much. They can float face up. Also, if the body stays on the surface of the water for a long time, it will release the built up gas and sink once again. Then the decomposition continues underwater, more gas accumulates and the body may refloat. Okay. Since refloats are at a more, uh, state, uh, more advanced state of decay, they may be more evenly bloated, and then they're more likely to flip over again and float face up. <laughs> Isn't this pleasant? All right, all these different patterns. But this is the, fun the funny thing. It says, um, so in all these shows, you see, and the person's floating on the pool. No, they would be at the bottom of the pool unless you found them a week later. Then they'd be floating. They're not floating when they when the when the when the somebody drowns someone in that pool, they sink like a rock to the bottom and they stay on the bottom of the pool. And I just thought that was so interesting because I'm like, they never show it that way. So now, <laughs> uh, uh, Lisa says I find it interesting. I will put a link. Okay, I will put a link. This is uh this is from Slate, oddly enough, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. Slate.com. <laughs> I got this. I'll put the link in because it's just a cool art. It's a very short article, but just, just really cool because I just thought about that when I was watching these shows. So keep your eyes out now. So now when you're watching a, 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 some crime show and somebody, some, somebody kills somebody and tosses them in the pool or drowns them in the pool. And an hour later, they call the, somebody finds the housekeeper finds the body and they call the police and you see the body floating in the pool. You know they're full of it. <laughs> That's not the way it works. So now you're going to be really, really smart, really, really smart, and you're going to know that that's not how bodies, um, you know, that's not what happens after death with a body in a pool. So it just really, uh, <laughs> I just think that's fascinating. Um, oh, like Lacey and Connor. Inter I forgot. I forgot. How long was Lacey missing? I don't quite remember that. 
Hmm. I'm not, I'm not sure how that worked, but, but, but what's interesting to see is when that's why I mean, a lot of times they'll put heavy objects on that person. They're dumping in. Um, if you know, if you, the other case uh, I did a few weeks ago, um, the South Carolina case of the elderly couple who was, the guy was killed in the house and his head was cut off. And um, his wife was then taken out on a boat and she was killed and she was tossed in the water, but she was weighted down with cement blocks. Um, the idea being that um, it would keep her down to the bottom of the lake. And apparently she stayed there for a while, but apparently the cement blocks just didn't do the job because she, and then she floated up and, and they found her body. So the idea was they knew they, they throw her in, she's going to float up at some point. They wanted her to stay at the bottom of, wanted her to stay at the bottom of the lake and never be found unless you do like sonar and have, you know, people diving and all that stuff. But apparently it didn't work real well for them. Uh, so <laughs> I thought that, um, so Kay Rob says, so bodies go to the bottom, but come up due to gas buildup, but their heads stay down. I guess that is where Mr. Derman's head is at the bottom of Lake Oconee. Oh, um, that's an interesting point. Um, so yeah, ge well, no, generally, I mean, generally speaking, the head's attached to the body. So the head will just, you know, just be forward in the water along with the arms and the legs that are forward in the water. Um, so that's the way you would normally find it. As far as, uh, Mr. Derman went, um, Let's see, Dermond, Mr. Dermond, they took his head and they did something with his head. Um, so yeah, uh, it depends. I have to look on, the head will go to the sink to the bottom. This is true. The question is, is there any reason it would ever float? And I don't know that there is a reason because I don't know how much gas is built up in, in a, with all the skull and everything. I'm gonna look that one up. That's, that's a good point. Um, well, it, well, it was, it was unattached. They're, they're, they're both just heads. I mean, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're just heads. Um, yeah. So, but they found Adam's head in the canal. They did find his head. Um, so I think there may be a lot of issues that go along with it, you know, with animal predators, uh, you know, the predators in there and, you know, all kinds of things. I'm, I'm going to look, I'm going to study the head issue. Usually what happens sometimes when I work a case, um, if I was working case and I run into something like this, I suddenly go, geez, I don't remember, you know, because I'm not, I'm not a friend, I'm not a pathologist, a forensic pathologist. And that's why I have books, which then I start studying the forensic pathology of whatever situation I might be dealing with. So much could have to do with the kind of water that the body's in, salt water, fresh water, uh, pond water, you know, there's so many elements to things that you got to then pay attention to that uh, in general. Um, Oh, that's, yes. Oh, that is true, too. On TV, they're perfectly floating and not bloated. Well, you know, yes, it, it's because, let's face it, um, decomposing bo bodies in water are some of the most unattractive corpses you'll ever run into. They have a lot of things where their you know, fingers are, you know, things are sliding off their hands, like a little, like white gloves on their hands, or, you know, the skin is coming out, all kinds of creepy things. So, it doesn't, you know, these days, in the old days, they were specifically not showing you anything that was too offensive. Uh, today, they seem to be much more offensive, and they want to show you really gory, creepy things, and I object to that personally. But yes, yeah, so usually they're found in, like, floating in the water, still wearing whatever they're wearing, their pajamas or their bathing suit or, or whatever, and they're looking just perfectly fine, except they're floating in the water. Yeah. <laughs> um, Uh, okay, yeah, the killer must must have known a body would eventually float, hence the cement blocks. Yes, uh, that is true. Most, of, I mean, pretty much that is a common thing that is done. Uh, when I did the, the uh, show on um, uh, Chapel, Bob Chapel, uh, in, uh, in uh, Tasmania, um, his body's never been found. And the theory is, is that he was attached to a fire extinguisher that was missing from the boat and the fire extinguisher being a heavy object that that was tied around him and he was dumped overboard in some deep area and then that fire extinguisher kept him down long enough and um you know then there are predators too that can you know eventually get rid of the body for you uh, but 
he, he went down with a fire extinguisher. So I think a lot of people pretty much know that if you don't want a body to be found, you want to weight it down. I think that's fairly common knowledge. So you don't have to be brilliant <laughs> to figure that one out. So now let me see if I missed anything. Uh, is there anything else I wanted to talk about? I think that might be it. Let me, let me just double check here. Um, I pull up so many things. Um, I think that uh, I'll do that one another week. I'm going to do that one another week. And let me see if there's anything left up here that I forgot I wanted to talk about. Um, I think that should be it. Um, but lots of, uh, let's see, uh, let's see what uh, Anne says. I think Scott Peterson attached something to Lacey, but she got loose and came up eventually. You know, that's an interesting point um, as well. Because the problem is when you tie something around a person, as they decompose at certain points, you know, then things can get loose. And yeah, they can kind of wiggle out <laughs> in their own way, you know, with, with water and movement and how well you tie things. All kinds of things can go wrong. And this is what I always say about, you know, if you're not a professional hit person and you don't aren't in the a business of professionally murdering people and disposing of them. Um, you make mistakes, stupid mistakes, because you just don't know how it works. Like I'm going to say the, 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 the mother there, the lady in the, in the, the rolling sports bag in New York, I'm going to say this was done at night, right? And she came home at midnight ish. So this is probably happening at one or two in the morning, right? That person was not paying attention to the fact that the blood was coming out. It may be in the middle of the day if he was pulling it going, dang, I can see blood on the sidewalk. But apparently maybe at night just didn't see it, you know, didn't, you know, because it was dark. Um, and then the next day it's like the police are like, oh, look, a little trail, <laughs> you know, it's clear now, you know. So you do stupid things when you don't know what you're doing. And that is what helps the police catch people. And most people aren't criminal masterminds, so... You, the, usually the reason they get away with it is luck, um, a lot of luck, that evidence gets destroyed, um, things like that. And, and I know so many times they'll say things like, oh, well, you know, uh, the person will eventually talk. Well, people don't necessarily talk, so you can't wait around for that. You really need to do a good job. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Oh, I should not talk about this. Are you saying we should burn bodies instead, Pat? Well, it depends. Um, if you look at Stephen Avery, the reason his goose is cooked along with his victim is because he tried to burn her up in the fire pit outside his house and, and left enough of her remnants to convict him and solidly convict him. And so ignoring all the people that think that somehow somebody brought her body back and burned it up in his backyard or burned her elsewhere and then dumped everything in the fire pit. Nonsense like that. The guy thought if he just took, he'd done her in, if he just put her in the fire pit where he had control over his property and he could burn her up, that he would get rid of all the evidence. And yet when he was caught and they did the investigation, they found remnants of her. And so you got to do a better job. But yes, sometimes that is a very effective way is to truly incinerate um, and remove all all the body. Um, another way that's really um, useful is um, I have giving murder tips here. Uh, if you can find the ravine, the ravine is a great place. If you can find a ravine that is away from hikers and, and, and uh, bikers and um, dog walkers, <laughs> just you know, don't, put the, don't put the body in the ravine next to a path. You know, just at least go far enough away and find a good ravine. Uh, and that's, that's why a lot of times you don't find bodies for years and years and years and then when they finally do find the body it's you know way too late to get any evidence from the body um because it's been in that little shallow grave in the ravine for a really long time um what yeah they're, uh, they're talking about um that's just that's just sad um the, the poor little yeah um yeah i'm not going to put that on the screen <laughs> sad um Oh, that, that's how interesting. A man, Byron Mac, Macron, slashed himself or was slashed by someone in his office and then ended up floating and bloating a few months later in a nearby lake. 
His death was ruled undetermined. That is one of the advantages of any body not being found for a really long time, um, is that unless there's a, like, a, if you have, um, if you're committing a, a crime with a knife, um, unless you're nicking bones really badly, um, a lot of times you can't prove anything um, because, of, uh, because of the decomposition. I mean, bullets are usually more useful. Like, you know, I find a bullet in the back of the skull, even if the body's decomposed, why is a bullet in the back of the skull? But you know, a slash throat, a lot of that decomposes and you can't really tell what happened. So it's kind of useful. Um, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this, is, this is going to be a scary conversation. <laughs> I'll push them off a cliff, in, cliff into a ravine. <laughs> okay, folks. <laughs> This is, I'm, I'm getting concerned that we have criminal intent in this in this oh oh I was gonna mention but uh, <laughs> I was gonna mention Barry Morphew this is this is interesting um Barry Morphew uh his wife went missing she supposedly went bicycling and then she went missing off the bicycle um and there's two theories one is Barry Morphew killed her and then staged the staged as if she went bicycling and threw the bike in a you know bicycle you know in a ravine um on the side of the road um and her body hasn't been found the police believe he did it there's a lot of stuff leaning his direction but the defense is saying there was some dna that maybe doesn't match him and maybe matches other people um and so they did arrest him um and they were going to prosecute him and they can't find the body. And I think the problem was at a certain point, the prosecutor's like, guys, if we're gonna lose this case, we just don't have enough. Guy looks squirrely as hell, but we do not have enough. And I agree, uh, even if he does look squirrely. Um, they're saying that they're close to finding her body. I don't know what the heck that means. <laughs> Again, that's one of these things. You either find her body, or you haven't found her body. I don't know how you get close to finding her body. I mean. You know, that makes no sense. Uh, so I think that's garbage, but maybe they think they have an idea where her body is now. Uh, maybe he gave up some information and they think, oh, we now know the general vicinity and we're gonna go after that. So there's two possibilities. One is the prosecution has dropped this. They can still charge him again. So now the defense is pissed off actually. They're saying, oh, they dropped it because they can't prove the case and now he's not gonna get his day in court. Now everybody's gonna think he's guilty and isn't that a terrible thing the prosecution did. But what they're really worried about is the prosecution can then charge him again when they're ready. If they find the body, then they might have the full case. So I think they got, uh, I got cold feet knowing that they didn't have enough evidence. And so if they can get the body, then they'll go forward with it. I think that's where they're at. Um, Maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we'll see what happens with that case. Uh, oh, the last, uh, there's anything else I want to say? Oh, I'm still waiting on the Sherry Papini thing. She has, you know, now, now she has been charged and she's also confessed. I'm still waiting to see I, I if Keith ever leaves her. I think personally he won't leave her. I think he'll, he's, he's the adult who's going to stay with her through thick and thin. Um, and, but I'm curious. Uh, there's some rumors around about a divorce, but, I just don't, th I don't think he's going to do it. I think he's going to stand by his lady because she's, she has problems and he loves her. <clears throat> yeah, she's a psychopath <laughs> and you're adult, you know. So we'll see what happens there. But I'm real curious to see when, when all that comes down. But anyway, that's it for tonight, I think. And so join me on Friday night. Um, we're going to the guy under the toilet. Really interesting case. Um, very unusual that it's just not your usual place you find a body and you know it's so weird um and uh on sunday i'll be doing uh jimmy seville so Savile. i always want to say seville it's not J jimmy Savile. um uh there's not i don't believe there's double jeopardy in this crime the d difference is double jeopardy is when i'm not a lawyer so i always screw these things up but double jeopardy is when you've been you've been found innocent of a crime and then they get more evidence and want to take you back to court and prove you guilty. Um, in this case, they haven't taken to court, so there's no double je jeopardy. Oh, you're welcome, Anne. I'm glad you came. It's been grand. Um, yeah, so Sunday will be uh, Jimmy Savo, um, and I will try to clear up what I think is uh, just 
I like I like things to be accurate. That's my big thing. I like accuracy, and I like things that make sense and are based on evidence. And while some things may be true, other things may not be true. And the media here, uh, they're 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 the media. So, um, <laughs> but I did I did watch the whole Netflix thing, which I did find quite interesting actually. Um, uh, some people said it was one of the most boring things they've ever seen, and I actually didn't find it boring. So go figure. Um, <laughs> which I usually do, so. But you know, I have to admit, I don't know a thing about Jimmy Savile. I'm not from the UK. I never knew who he was, so, so I was learning about him. So maybe that's why I was interested. And you're welcome, Florence. I'm so glad everybody came tonight. Um, it's been fun. Um, <laughs> everybody say good night to everybody. Um, and again, if you're still here and you haven't subscribed to the channel, do that. And um, I'll see some of you on Friday um, who are or awake at uh, 9 p.m. Eastern time. <laughs> oh, and so and then we have Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And then it should be next Tuesday. I'll be doing an early phone in um, at about 3, 8, it'll be about 3 p.m. or 4 p.m. I haven't quite figured out the time. And Benny says he's going to call in. So that's our call in show. And of course, more people can call in than one person. Eventually, what I'm hoping is that people will call in and I'll spend you know, 15 or 20 minutes with one person and then another person has a question or something you want to discuss, uh, something they want to talk about and more than one will do that. But we're just beginning with the uh, call-in. So, but Benny, Benny says, I want to talk. So Benny's going to be my first caller. If he can, he's going to be calling in from Denmark. And so uh, he, he, he wanted to come tonight, but it's, it was one o'clock in Denmark when this started. So, <laughs> you know, he's like, yeah, no, <laughs> I'm going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Most welcome, Carrie. Bye. Bye, everybody. I will see you very, very soon. Let me see. Wait a minute. I'm, try I'm trying to close out the show and I can't find my little pieces here. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Bye.